In this video, I'm going to be explaining how Facebook's system architecture evolved over time from something simple like this to something more like this. Now, how do I know anything about this? Well, in 2005, about one year after Facebook's initial launch, Mark Zuckerberg was a guest lecturer at Harvard University's CS50 course. And if you've never heard of CS50, it's basically the most popular introductory computer science course on the internet today. Now, during Zuckerberg's 1.5 hour lecture, he talks a lot about how Facebook faced different types of problems as the application expanded to more universities, more users, and of course, more features. Personally, I find that there's a lot of valuable learnings to be had from this type of analysis because you get to understand the problem as it was at the time and the progressive steps that Zuckerberg and his team took to solve it. Now, lucky for you, you don't have to watch that 1.5 hour video because I watched the entire thing and I'm gonna summarize it for you in the next 10 or so minutes. But first, you need a little bit of context into how Facebook originally worked. And by the way, did you know it was originally called the Facebook? That's just weird, right? In today's world, Facebook is a global application. You can search for absolutely anyone on the platform and provided you know the person's name and the person doesn't have some kind of overly restrictive privacy settings. Now, an interesting historical fact here is that Facebook was originally developed so that you could only connect with a user that went to the same school. So for instance, if you went to one school and your friend goes to another, you wouldn't have been able to interact with each other. But if you both went to the same school, you would. Now this is an important point because this product decision had a very interesting effect on the way the architecture was able to evolve to scale to the crazy amount of users that Facebook had, around 6 million or so at the time. So in the very early stages, the entire Facebook platform was hosted on a single rented computer. The exact configuration that Zuckerberg was used was what's called a LAMP stack, which consisted of Linux for the operating system, Apache for the web server, MySQL for the database, and PHP as the programming language. Now, of course, a good amount of HTML and CSS were also used for the styling of the website. This architecture was super straightforward. When a request came in, the Apache server would receive the request, query the database that was running on the same machine, and then return the content back to the user. And this is how Facebook originally worked for the first thousand users or so. Now, most of you may be inclined to think that Facebook started with some super sophisticated architecture and some well thought out design, but we can see here that this is completely the opposite. LAMP stacks were and still continue to be, to this day, one of the most simple tech stacks out there. And by the way, WordPress sites, which power about 33% of the entire internet, are hosted on LAMP stacks. It's literally everywhere. Now, what I really want to point out here before I move on is that you don't need to be some kind of genius and over-engineer a solution when you're starting a new product. If you build a good enough product that solves a problem for people, it's bound to do well. So as I always say, when you're starting a new project, just keep it simple. During Facebook's rapid expansion in 2004 and 2005, Zuckerberg describes a key architecture decision to allow the application to scale to millions of users. The biggest barrier for scale at the time was the algorithm that was used to power the friends of a friends or connections feature that everyone on Facebook really loves. And there's something just so interesting about finding mutual friends. Now Zuckerberg goes into quite a lot of depth about this problem, but I'll summarize the essence of it here for you now. So say there's me, Daniel, and you, and we're friends with one another. And I wanna know who are our mutual friends? So who are the people that we both have as friends? Now, how can I go about doing that? Well, the most simple and most straightforward way to figure this out is to one by one, examine each of one of my friends and see if they're connected to you. And separately, examine each one of your friends and see if they're connected to me. The resulting users would be those individuals that are mutual friends of both of us. Now, this is all fine when you're looking only one level down like we are here. But what happens if we want to know who are the common mutual friends of your friends' friends? That would be three levels deep. 
The complexity for solving this computation grows exponentially. So with each level, we need to examine more and more users to find out our mutual friends. Or similarly, to find out how or if two people are somehow connected to one another. Zuckerberg describes this problem as being one of the key drivers of a major architectural decision how to scale their application to still maintain this lovable feature, but also make the computation more manageable. Now, how Zuckerberg and the company decided to solve this problem is to partition his single database of users into one database per university. Now, afterwards, when a request came in to find who are the mutual friends four or five levels deep, the number of users we have to search for becomes much, much smaller because you're only looking for mutual friends within your own school. Now, some actually say that he didn't really solve the problem. He just restricted the usability of Facebook to allow it to scale, but that's a completely separate topic for another video. Now, Zuckerberg himself acknowledged that this was a technical decision that ended up working out pretty well for the company and allowed them to scale to around 50 or 100 schools which is where the next problem surfaced its head. Now, the next key problem that Zuckerberg faced after this was the variance of usage between schools. For instance, a large school like Penn State had over 50,000 users, while a small university in Ohio would only have a thousand or so users. Now, the existing architecture meant that if a surge of users from Penn State were overloading the server with requests and brought down the hosting machine, users from other schools will also be affected. Obviously, this was a really bad experience. In order to solve this problem, Zuckerberg opted to separate out the application machines that received web traffic from his database machines, which stored and served all the underlying data. Separately, he split up the databases onto multiple different machines. This approach had many key benefits, but the biggest two are as follows. Now, number one, the application machines would be used generically to process a request for any university. This made the application fleet of machines generic and allowed them to simply keep on adding more machines to the fleet in order to scale. This concept is called horizontal scaling, and I have an entire video about this topic, and I'll put that in the description section below. Now, the second key benefit is that the databases for each school can now exist on completely separate machines and not on the same instance. This means that an outage for a single machine would not affect an outage in another. This was a huge boost to reduce the blast radius so that only a subset of users were affected in the case of an issue with a single database machine. Now, the next major problem that Zuckerberg faced had to do with SQL. Now, MySQL is a pretty great out of the box database, but when you're getting over 100 million page views a day and several hundred thousand concurrent users at a given time, even MySQL has its limits. The hurdle for Zuckerberg was to scale the application even further by introducing a caching layer. Now, if you haven't heard of a cache before, I'm not going to go into it into too much detail, I actually have a whole video on caches, which I'll put down below so you can watch that separately. But essentially, caching is the idea that for a given request for a user, instead of having the application query the database, we can instead store a copy of that information in memory. And I emphasize in memory here because in memory lookups are extremely, extremely efficient, extremely fast. Now, by using this approach, we can offload some of the computation off of the database servers and instead store some of that redundant information in memory on the application machines or in a caching fleet. Now, to be precise, Zuckerberg used Memcache, which is an open source caching library and configured it to be distributed over many machines. So cache data was split up across multiple different machines in the cache fleet. Now, this approach allowed the application to scale to even more users, but had some big holes in it. Specifically, Zuckerberg mentioned that Facebook had major issues when a single cache fleet machine went down. And the main reason this happens is because caches are generally key value lookup stores. And what do you think Zuckerberg probably used for the key? It was probably the school, right? Now, the way Memcache works is that it distributes your data based on the input key. 
So if a single machine went down, it could potentially be storing all of the cache data for an entire school. So if this happened, incoming requests would find no data in the cache and have to query the underlying database for that data. Now at Facebook scale, this could cause the underlying database to go down or get swarmed with requests. Now Zuckerberg doesn't go much further into this particular problem, but does mention that they made some custom modifications to the memcache library in order to mitigate this issue. As a quick little post analysis, it's very interesting to look at all of these changes and to see how Facebook's architecture evolved to solve all of these small problems as they arose. So I hope you learned something and found this video enjoyable. And if you did, hit that like and subscribe button and make sure to check out the other software engineering and system design videos on my channel. Thanks so much and I'll see you next time.